Mm. Say hello to everybody here. As we get set, let's see. Come on, YouTube. Let's go make this happen now. All right, I think we should be all right. <clears throat> now we're coming in. Hopefully. YouTube. Let's see. Well, maybe the internet connection is not going well. Anybody, you can, if anybody is out there, please uh, leave a comment. Let me know if you're here. Hopefully we'll see if this is working or not. I think, I think we're working. I think we can. I wonder why it's not, why is it not working over here though? Maybe my connection is just slow. Okay, all right, I think we're in. All right, look at that. Now everybody goes there. Nice to see everybody there. Uh, I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. Welcome. All right, we should have uh, an interesting one today. Uh, this was from a question I had uh, from a learner, actually, uh, on one of these uh, live videos. Nice to see everybody there. I don't have a lot of time today, uh, so I want to jump right into this. <clears throat> uh, but this was from a learner asking uh, about how to make English uh, like a native language in their home. Uh, and so, hopefully, you guys will enjoy this. I wanted to begin, as I often do, with a quick story. So I was having lunch with a friend of mine and his daughter yesterday. Uh, we went to an Indian restaurant, actually, and she is uh, a good, so this is his daughter, she's a good speaker of English, uh, but like many of the people who I help, uh, she has trouble thinking and translating and hesitating when she speaks. So she can often understand things and she can write English really well, but when she has to respond quickly, she often has trouble doing that. So I was explaining to her about what I do with helping learners, uh, the English as a first language approach and helping people get fluency triggers and all the things that I talk about. Uh, but I wanted to explain to her, I'll just very quickly explain this for you uh, because it's really part of helping your students uh, or your children if you're trying to do this uh, in your own home to help your own kids learn to speak English well. Uh, so I was explaining to her that the reason she struggles, the reason she has to think and translate and process information and think about sentences before she speaks is because she learned English through Japanese. Uh, and so it, rather than learning English directly as a first language, she really is trying to study things and understand rules, and that's how she's learning to speak. Uh, so, of course, when you're learning uh, through translations, you will speak through translations as well. So I said, let me give you an example right here in this Indian restaurant. I'm going to teach you some alien, just an alien word for something. And I want to see if you can understand this in the alien language. I will not use Japanese or English or any other language to teach you this. And so I just gave very quickly, I was pointing at different things on the table. Uh, I pointed at some rice. And then uh, I said, ka. And she said, oh, like ka means rice. I said, no, no, that's actually incorrect. Just wait and listen. So I pointed at the rice, just a regular bowl of uh, white rice, and I said, ka. And then I pointed to a plate, and I said, ka, again. And then I pointed to a napkin, and I said, ka. And I pointed to a little piece of paper, and it said, or I said, ka, again. Uh, and as I gave her more examples, she said, oh, white, and then she got it. So at that point, I, I basically gave her a fluency trigger rather than teaching her a definition or a translation. So this is just a very quick example of how you can help someone understand something in the language without trying to give them the answer. So I really want to help people discover the way uh, to learn or discover the definitions of things rather than just tell you what things mean. Because if you understand it really the same way a native does, you speak fluently, all right? So having spoken about this story, uh, I wanted to explain something uh, just in this video about how I'm teaching my own kids at home. So how I make a native English environment for my own kids because I live in Japan and most of their day is all in Japanese. So they have 
you know, a mother who's Japanese and grandparents who are Japanese and their friends in school. So all of these things, it's basically a non-native environment. The only thing that really makes it more native is because I happen to be teaching them. But remember, uh, it's not about me being a native that makes them native. It's about how I teach. And so if I can help them understand things without thinking about translations or definitions, then I can help them understand. So let me give you an example of this. <clears throat> uh, it's another kind of story from my, uh, from my life and just uh, something that actually happened recently. I'll go back through chat very quickly to make sure um, nobody has any questions I'm missing. I want to be, again, very quick, so hello. Nice to see everybody there. Pardon me if I don't go through everybody's name, but I really want to give you guys some good content today. Uh, let's see, Barem says, uh, how to improve speaking skills or listening skills. Uh, you'll learn about that in this video. Ivan says hello again. Nice to see you watching from Morocco. Hi from Japan. Nice to see everybody out there, people from all over. Lewis says, if you was speaking with other American, I think you would speak faster. Yes, you could say if you were speaking. Yes. So typically I would be speaking faster with other English speakers. This is the way I would speak. Uh, and you'll find me speaking this way in Fluent for Life. Uh, that's the program where I actually show you how to go from understanding teachers to understanding native speakers. Uh, can he read a live chat or is he just teaching? I'm doing both. All right, hello teacher. Uh, the English pronunciation is similar but the meaning is completely different. For example, weak and weak. Yes, so we have uh, words like this. These are called homonyms where you have the same sound uh, but the word is different. So there are actually quite a few interesting words like this where like the spelling is the same but the pronunciation is different like read and read. It just depends on the context. Um, but if you'd like to learn more about that and understand these and learn these differences, uh, you should get Frederick. So click on the link in the description below this video. You will find a link for Frederick. Uh, but very quickly, so the English as a, as a second language way, I wanted to explain this in a different way today. Let's just call this uh, so ESL, so you're learning English through your native language. I'm going to put a grammar table up here just as an example, so I'm not going to fill it in. Uh, but I want you to understand the different ways that non-natives are learning uh, versus how a native is learning. So the kind of native environment I create in my own home, this is an example of that. So again, learning English as a second language means you begin with your native language and try to think, uh, try to think and translate and learn that way. So you're learning, let's say I'm uh, in Brazil, so I'm learning English through Portuguese, and then I'm thinking and translating in Portuguese when I speak. So if you learn, that way you will speak that way too. So that's the English as a second language the typical way people learn. So what I do in my home, I'm actually trying to teach my kids English directly. So I want them to understand English as a first language. So in both cases, we still have a grammar table. Now what's interesting about this uh, is in the case of people learning uh, like English as a second language, you will get a grammar table like this and it will have all the information filled out for you because people think that this is like the better way to teach. Hey look, here is a table with all the grammar rules. So we have like a get, gone, gotten, and we go through all of these like eat, ate, ate, and we're going to go through all of these examples uh, and help you understand everything and hopefully you remember it on the test. But probably you will forget it and have trouble remembering and using these things confidently in your conversations. But this is basically what people are doing. All right? But I want to make it clear that in both cases, uh, both non-natives and natives are still, they're basically trying to fill out this grammar table. Uh, and I'm just giving the example of a grammar table, but it's really understanding the rules of the language and the patterns of the language, but we do it differently when you're learning the native way. All right? So the native way, what I really want to help people do is understand uh, and eliminate the doubt they have about particular words and phrases. So what happens is when an English speaker, like a native English speaker, a native child learns something, they really learn one thing at a time. So they get maybe one example of something. I'll give you a, like an actual example of this in a minute, but I just want you to understand the difference here. When an English as a second language student begins a lesson with a grammar table, they're actually having all of this filled out. But they're, they don't really understand it very well. They probably don't remember it and they can't use it fluently. But in contrast, 
a child, they're actually learning things. They get like maybe a few examples, and as they get these examples, they can start making connections and understand, oh, like if we have this one and this one, then maybe I know what that one is too. And so this is where we get an example, like a, a child learns walk, and they learn the past tense of that is walked, as an example. But we're not, we're not actually doing it. I don't actually teach my kids with a grammar table. I'm just, I'm, cry, I'm trying to make it clear what's going on in the mind of a native speaker as they learn, so that you can do this same thing uh, for your learning by yourself to become a more fluent speaker, or if you're trying to make that environment in your own home. So in this example, we have walk, and then walk, uh, maybe have like talk over here. And so they learn the past tense is talked. All right, so they hear that just naturally. So I'm talking right now. Yesterday, I talked about something. So they hear, oh, that's interesting, walk. And then we have the past tense over here, which is walked. All right, but this is, it's just a natural process of understanding the situation and what word do we use in that situation. So if we're right now, something is happening, I am walking. But yesterday, I walked. So without telling them, they don't even know like past and present and future. We're not talking about any names of grammar tenses. It's just understanding in this situation, uh, the, this is the word that we use. All right. Uh, anime says, uh, hopefully I pronounced that correct. Let me see. Uh, 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 mine, excuse me. The L is silent. Yes, you would say talk. Talk. You will hear. <clears throat> you will hear some people say maybe like talk, talk, uh, like a little bit, but it's usually just talk, talk. And Nils is back. Nice to see Nils from Wisconsin over there. All right. So, so they learn something like walk, and then they hear something like oh walked. That's interesting. And then they hear talk, and then they hear oh talked. That's interesting. So they're they're developing a sense of pattern recognition. So they're thinking oh okay walk becomes walked, and talk becomes talked. And so, oh, look at that. We probably have an ED at the end of something. So if they were, if they learn a word like play, they learn, oh, play, they might automatically think, I wonder, I bet, I guess, probably, the past tense of that would be played, okay? So what's happening in uh, a native's mind, they're not actually going through all of the grammar tables kind of in order like this, they're learning kind of random pieces of it and starting to put these together as, ah, I, I start understanding it now, I'm starting to get it. Now, an interesting thing happens when they learn an irregular thing or something that breaks the pattern. So that's why you would hear a child make a mistake like goad. So we say, oh, like I, I goad to the park yesterday. So this is the logical thing you would expect from the language. But we don't say goad, we say went. And as they get more examples of that, they become used to that thing. That's how they start filling out this grammar table. Okay, so it's, it's really just an understanding of that where they start learning rules because they get examples, but it's not, they don't start with everything filled out. It's like a puzzle and they get pieces of it, but because they understand these pieces, now they can start filling out more of it just with their own pattern recognition, all right? So let me give you an even better example of this. I just wanted to do this with grammar uh, because it's very simple, but what I'm trying to do in my house, the core idea, the thing I really want is to help them eliminate any doubt they have about vocabulary, okay? So that's the main goal the main thing I'm trying to do when I teach. So remember a regular, like a typical English lesson, a teacher will give like a word. Uh, let's say I just, I don't know, I'm gonna like, I'll teach you the word stop uh, in, in whatever your native language is and you would get a translation of that. That's not really teaching you anything. I'm just giving you information and then you have to remember that. But for me, as a parent, I really want to be able to communicate with my kids. So I have to make the language understandable. I have to eliminate any doubt that they have, all right? So kind of like this example, I'm going to just talk about something else recently that happened, this story, uh, just in my, in my daily life about how I help, learn, uh, or help my kids learn English at home. So right now, my, uh, my older daughter, Aria, she's eight years old, and she's learning about volume. 
uh, like volume in, in containers, you know, like this. So we have a container, you know, how much liquid or how much stuff can we fit in this? And so in, Jap uh, in Japanese classes, she's learning about the metric system. So we actually, it's different from uh, how we would do it in English. So we say like, you know, feet and inches, which is a, a real pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, but my daughter is not learning about feet and inches right now. She's learning about meters and centimeters, okay? So what happens is, uh, just like this grammar table over here, She's developing a sense for what's the correct thing and trying to understand what something means. So we begin with one meter. So one meter, this won't be like an actual meter. A meter is, you know, like this long or something. Uh, but just so you get the idea that a meter works in the same way that a grammar table does. Uh, it's really about uh, recognizing these patterns and then how can we take those patterns and apply them in other situations. When else can we use the vocabulary? All right, so she learns at one meter, uh, and she's also learning uh, like a liter. So this is like a liter, uh, this is a two liter bottle. So I'm going to make this uh, shorter here. You guys probably know these uh, definitions already. Uh, but again, this is new for a child. So we begin with one uh, liter, I'll just put that as a, uh, a curvy L right there, and then one meter, okay? So she learns both of those examples. She knows what a liter of water is. This is a two liter bottle, so a one liter would be half this. <clears throat> and then a meter, she knows what that is. And then she starts learning like one, like one deci liter. And the same thing here, one deci, what deci, uh, excuse me. I can never write and, and talk at the same time, deci liter, all right? And then she learns one centi liter, one centimeter as well. So as she's learning these examples, she can start making connections. Oh, that's interesting. You can have one liter or one meter. Or you can have one deci, which would be one-tenth of that. Or one cent, which means one one-hundredth. All right? So the same idea. And so what's interesting about this is that I can take something like if we have, uh, like, I want to have like one milliliter. One milliliter. And so by, by understanding this, if she understands these, she can guess, just like this grammar table over here, that we have, we have uh, one milliliter over here. We probably also have one millimeter. The same idea. Okay? So the first idea here is that we're, uh, rather than trying to teach like all of these as, a, as, as like, like a row and you have to remember, remember the whole table, she's learning pieces of these. And you could start with any one of these things. We typically start with something like one liter or one meter, and then she's now learning, oh, these are pieces of that. So a deciliter is one-tenth of that, and a decimeter is one-tenth of a meter. So you take 10 of those and get that, all right? Now, here's what's interesting. We don't stop here. What I do as a, as a teacher at home and really trying to make sure that she understands what these things mean I start looking at these individual pieces and I think, where else could we learn this? Or where else could we use this? So as an example, we might have a century. A century is 100 years. A century is 100 years. A century. Isn't that interesting? We've got cent is one one hundredth, we got a one hundredth of something. A century is one hundred years. Where else might we hear that? So if we're looking, uh, looking at uh, American money, we've got dollars and cents. Dollars and cents. So we've got dollars, uh, and then we've got, this is a little symbol for cent over here. Isn't that interesting? So there are one hundred cents. There are one hundred cents in a dollar. Isn't that interesting? 100 cents in a dollar. And now we were reading, there was another book we were reading, it was about a centipede. 
a centipede. A centipede. What is a centipede? A centipede. I'll try to draw one for you here. Pretty easy to draw. A centipede. So a centipede kind of looks like this. A little like. Little bug like that. A centipede with a lot of legs. So I asked my daughter, look at that, how many legs, if this is called a centipede, how many legs do you think it has? And she said, oh, 100. Now, an actual centipede probably has like 30 legs, but still the idea is like, it's the same kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting, we're making a connection. You see I'm going from here to here to here. The point is to give lots of different examples to really help people understand the language, okay? Now we take it even another step forward. So we've got sent, and then we've got this part over here. What do you think this means? I'll leave that for the chat as I go back and check chat, but hopefully if people are following me, you should know the answer to that. Even if you've never heard this word before, you don't know what a centipede is, now you know this is a kind of bug with a lot of legs. So what do you think that means? I'll give you guys a moment to figure that out. Let's see if you can do that. All right, see if anybody has any questions over here. All right, so nice to see everyone is, all right, other people, look at that. We got people from Japan, Brazil. Let's see, BF said, teacher, what's your name? Do you know about sense and reference? What's your name? Drew, if you're talking about me, uh, do I know about sense and reference? I don't know what you're referring to, what, what reference to what. Bruno says, long time no Z. Uh, okay, I think I answered that one already. Nice to see you there. Hi, I caught up with you from Somali. Nice to see you there. Can you recommend the best way to get better in vocabulary? I'm satisfied with my level. Uh, I can fairly communicate, but the vocabulary thing, I'm stuck at B2. Uh, the problem is you probably don't know the vocabulary as well as you think you do. So many people, I made a video about this talking about the three different levels of fluency. So the first is exposure, where you just maybe hear some vocabulary, you don't know it very well. Uh, the next level is awareness, where you recognize information. But then the highest level is fluency and the way you get from knowing vocabulary to using it fluently uh, is to eliminate any doubt you have about that vocabulary. So this is an example of how I'm trying to make these different pieces of vocabulary uh, basically more clear. I want to eliminate any doubt that my children might have about these different things. Okay, so if you're trying to get from uh, like one level to the next, then that's how you would do it. So it's not about learning more vocabulary. Uh, you need to know that vocabulary better. You need to have no doubt at all about the vocabulary you want to say. Lewis says, how many words uh, you have to learn to achieve fluency? Is there a number? What do you think? Uh, I, it's the same answer I usually give, which is one. You, you become fluent in individual words and phrases as you learn them. So if you don't know the vocabulary very well, you could know a lot of words but not be a good speaker. So it doesn't matter how many words you know, you could know 10,000 words, but how well do you know that vocabulary? If you have any doubt, any worry, any question about that vocabulary, then you won't use it, okay? So this is why we become fluent in individual words and phrases as we learn, rather than in a, like, like it's not a process that happens. You don't become fluent after you learn a bunch of words. You become fluent in individual words and phrases as you come to understand them, like I'm helping you do with scent over here. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see. Steve says, assimilation and accommodation helps intelligence. Uh, that's true, let's see. You can buy a vocabulary book, blue cover. It's an excellent book to develop your vocabulary. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, it says decade also, yes. Another good example from Desi, so a decade becomes 10. Now it's an interesting thing like the word December. It should be the 10th month. It should be the 10th month, but it is not. It is the 12th month, uh, but it used to be. All right, if, you, if you change your counting around, dec should be the 10th month. Isn't that interesting? Just like October. So oct, we've got the 8th month. 
All right, October, October. All right, let's see here if anybody else got the answer to this. All right. Uh, about amount of vocabulary is not relevant. It's about flow as you still have some unknown words in your language. Amount of vocabulary doesn't count as much as other components. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> All right, BF, true, even though I saw a picture that says when you learn 2,000, you're fluent. Uh, yeah, that's incorrect. I, I would just, it's, it's easy to check any of this information. Anytime you hear something about learning, just test it for yourself. Can you have someone who knows 2,000 words but not speak? Yes, there are a lot of people like that, a lot of them. <coughs> yes, so ped, meaning feet. So a centipede is like, it's like a 100 foot, even though it probably only has about 30 legs. <coughs> but isn't that interesting, okay? <coughs> and so we can think of something else like a pedal on a bicycle. So ped, the same idea, P-E-D, ped, all right? So you see, what I'm doing is I'm helping make connections, and then Aria and Noel, my daughters, they can fill in, they can kind of naturally do this, they're just kind of conscious, well, more like subconsciously doing it, they do it automatically, they're filling in this grammar table that gives them the sense for communicating correctly. So if you want to make your own home or even your own learning more like this, you should go deeper into the vocabulary to make sure you really understand it. You don't need to get 50 examples of something, but just enough to tell you understand something where you can make that connection in your mind, you understand the pattern, and you can also take it and apply it, <coughs> excuse me, somewhere else. So just like this, I've taken cent, like centimeter, or centiliter, so these are just examples of prefixes and suffixes, but this works with anything, okay? So I could take, uh, as an example, I was having a conversation earlier today with a Fluid for Life member, uh, and uh, she was, uh, I was just giving her some examples about this. Uh, as an example from baseball, so when you hit the ball out of the park, that's called a home run, a home run. So a home run becomes uh, anything that is like a great job. You did something amazing. And so it's not just for baseball. We can talk about writing a report. So you did a great job on your report. You hit a home run. Or wow, you found like a really good boyfriend or girlfriend. You really hit a home run with that person. Okay, so you did something great. The point is you understand the situation directly as a native speaker rather than through your native language. Okay, so this is what it means to learn a language as a first language and if you want to understand better yourself, uh, but also if you're trying to teach your own kids, like you know, you live wherever and you want to make your own home a more of a, an English speaking environment, you must eliminate the doubt people have. You don't sit there and give them a grammar table to memorize, you help people make connections like this. So just like this, I want my, my children to be thinking like this, so my daughter, she knows, ah, scent. When she hears that, she can probably guess, I bet that means 100, okay? So it's related to that in some way. So we have 100 cents in a dollar, or 100 years, that kind of thing, all right? So hopefully this makes sense. Let me go back and look through chat. Uh, if people have any questions about this or anything else, let me know. <clears throat> yes, pedestrian, that's another word. So somebody walking on foot. A pedestrian, a pedestrian. Uh, set P, yes. I think, did I spell that correctly? Of course, I spelled that incorrectly. <clears throat> uh, can you teach us how to pronounce ED verbs in linking words like I worked at? Ah, uh, we do this in Fluent for Life. That's already done. And I've, if you search my YouTube channel, you should probably find uh, more pronunciation, uh, especially Frederick as well. Let me put that up here, make sure that fits. So Frederick, this is our pronunciation app that will let you hear lots of things like ED words, okay? So it actually gives you lots of examples to hear the difference for uh, when you would pronounce them differently, okay? So if you want to do that, that's, it's all done for you in the app. Uh, let's see, Rose Valdez's great job, Professor, well, it's my pleasure. 
All right, let's see. Practice journaling. Yes, you could do that. But again, like uh, I want to make this as simple as possible. Like you don't need to do journaling uh, in order to understand individual words. What you're really trying to do is know when do we use something and when else might we use that thing. And those connections are what make it very uh, strong in your mind. So you don't forget it. Uh, Blue Sky, what is the difference between on the train and by the train? <coughs> The difference between on the train and by the train. You should watch the video I made uh, talking about this specific idea, but I'll just cover it very quickly again. Here's our train. If I'm on the train, there are two things I could be doing. I could be sitting up here on the top of it, or I could be riding on the train. If I'm by the train, I'm around this particular area. So I could be here, I'm by the train, by the train. Over here, I'm not by the train. I'm a little bit further away. Okay, so this is by, like within this, by, on, on. So if, I, uh, if I'm talking with a friend of mine, I say, oh, I'm by the train. So depending on how long the train is, it means I'm around the train in some way. I could be here, 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 anywhere around this, all right, this particular area. So I could be close by the train. I could be nearby. I could be around the train. So usually you will meet somebody and you're on the phone. You need, to, you need to find the specific location. I say, oh, I'm on the train. And they go on the train and they're looking. And I say, no, no, I'm on the train. I'm sitting on top of the train. <laughs> All right, so I need to be more clear. I'm on top of the train. I'm on top of the train. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, uh, let's see. C says, uh, scent, which is mean full with smells that related to scent also? Uh, no, not that I know of, but that's interesting. Like, it could be like a way to remember that. So sometimes uh, it's not exactly, also you have like the center, but uh, they, it's not always the case that a word will be like have an exact meaning. Even, even a word like, uh, like in, we could be talking about different things. Typically, it's inside a particular space, but I might also be like in the middle of a conversation. All right, so it's kind of inside something, but not like physically inside of it. So you will have words where the meaning is a little bit different, and this is why it's important to get lots of, uh, lots of examples, lots of naturally varied review. So you want different examples, different times, different places where you can really understand something very well. So I know it seems like you're spending more time on individual words, and that's true at the beginning. But if you learn this way, it saves you way more time down the road. So over time, you become fluent much faster because you're getting fluent. You really understand you're eliminating the doubt that you have for individual words and phrases. So this is pronunciation, grammar, anything. All right, so now you know, oh, look at that, a centipede. And I guess you could probably, you can probably tell a millipede. Oh my goodness, a millipede is also a thing too. So if we have a millimeter and a milliliter and a millipede, wow, a centipede has 100 legs. I bet a millipede must have 1,000 legs. Wow. I think actually some, some millipedes might have over 1,000 legs. So a millipede and a centipede, different things. Millipede is kind of like a, it's a little bit bigger of like a thing like this. It almost looks like a long kind of hot dog looking thing with all these legs on it like that. A millipede, just look up a picture of one, a millipede. But it's the same idea. Uh, and again, we really want to help you understand something so you feel confident about using it. All right, so it's not just for prefixes uh, or suffixes or, or, or word pieces like this. I'm just using this as an example to make connections with things. Because if I just say, like, to a child, a centimeter doesn't really mean anything. But as soon as they recognize, oh, cent, like, it's 100 of something. I got it. And now we have 100 pieces of, uh, of a distance or 100 of, a, of like, an, a volume of, of liquid or something like that. So a milliliter or a millimeter. All right, uh, let's see. So Bruno has a let's see, centurion, which is an officer in the army, is responsible for 100 soldiers. Yep, yeah, very good. A centurion. 
BF says, oh, okay, I'm stu I study translation, literature, and deeper English, uh, phonemes, phonology, morphology, syntax, any sense, references in phonology. Anyway, I thought you may know about it. Ah, well, it, it, I, if, you're, if, you're, if you're talking about fluency, which is the, the subject of this video, uh, I didn't know what that specifically was referring to, but... All right, let's see. Uh, let's see, Limus from Cuba. All right, I have watched a few videos from you to improve my English fluency, know a bit about your life. Just out of curiosity, are you living in Japan now, and is your wife a Japanese? Yes, I do live in Japan. Looks like uh, Nishi, that's an interesting name. Is that your name? Uh, yes, my wife is Japanese, and I live in Nagasaki, Japan. All right, uh, be having on in on top. Yeah, all right. And look at that, XDL got the iPhone 15. I know you were thinking about that. <laughs> Let's see, Zoster says he requests for urgent management of asthma. Is that a correct sentence? Uh, I guess technically, yes, if you're talking about you need to get a problem like asthma under control. He requests for urgent management of asthma, but uh, that would be this specific wording, the way you have the sentence here. This would be like if somebody said, uh, like the doctor requests that I'm talking about the doctor rather than like he said I should I need to get my asthma under control or something so that would be a more casual way uh, of expressing that so a more like the way like a non-native doctor would say is like you need urgent management of your asthma but a, a casual conversational way is you need to get your asthma under control get your asthma under control uh, and I mean, it says getting different examples from different points of view. Yes, that's correct. So the point is we need to get more information to help us really understand something. And the goal is just to eliminate any doubt you have about using vocabulary or grammar, or pronunciation, anything else. So if you have doubt, it means you're not feeling confident. You need to replace that doubt with confidence by getting more examples, whatever you need to help you understand that. But that's what triggers the fluent communication switch in your brain and allows you to speak. Uh, let's see, I don't know what management of asthma change requests. <clears throat> uh, and Nurse says, uh, you really made me understand the usefulness of ES, uh, EFL and also you highlighted to me the difference between both methods, uh, watching you all the way from Somalia. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yes, uh, it, it really is a simple idea, but many people have been learning the traditional way for so many years, it's hard when I, when I try to teach them something different. <laughs> but uh, I think it's easier for many people, uh, if, you, if you have trouble speaking, it's not you, it's just think about the, the way that you're learning. Is that helping you learn and get fluent and become a better speaker, or is it not? And for most people, it's not because our brains don't really enjoy learning and improve very well with the traditional way. You certainly can, but most people do not, and it's much better to just try to eliminate the doubt as quickly as possible. You don't need a thousand examples, but you really need just as, uh, enough examples. It could be two or three or five or something. Like I gave in the uh, earlier in this video, I'm talking about uh, teaching my friend's daughter a like a word in, in an alien language, like ka. And I'm touching these different things. If I only touch a bowl full of rice and I say ka, it's really not clear what I'm talking about. If I don't explain that or give you any other information, if you only hear ka and I'm touching a bowl of rice, then you, you might guess I'm talking about rice. But maybe I'd mean the color or I mean the shape or I'm counting all of the little grains of rice. I could be meaning lots of different things. So that's why we need to get more examples. And it's better to do this rather than just get a definition or a translation of something because we want to really understand. We want to give ourselves, give our brains that moment of understanding, like solving a puzzle, because that's what actually allows you to speak. When you think, ah, I got it. I understand what that means now. Ah, that aha moment you get, that's when you start speaking. Okay. All right. Let's see if we have any more questions. Oh, it looks like we don't. Wow, look at that. 39 minutes. This may be a record, uh, a record speed lesson here. <laughs> so we got through this. Yes, I didn't think it would be a long lesson. 
but I'm happy uh, that people, if they're understanding exactly what's happening here, the basic idea is that if you want to make your own learning for you personally, or if you're trying to help your own children, or you just want to make that environment in your, in your own house, the goal is not to like put English, you know, stickers on everything or whatever. It's just to eliminate whatever doubt you have about, about vocabulary. And as you understand things more like a native, you will speak more like a native. So it's a very natural process. I live in Japan and I am really the only native influence on my children for them learning other than maybe them watching TV shows or something. And they will learn a lot uh, from TV shows, but they're, they're learning it directly in English. And what they're doing is they're correcting or connecting, excuse me, they're connecting the vocabulary with situations, okay? So they learn, like my younger daughter, I was, I was doing something and Noel said to me, don't panic. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm okay. I'm not panicking over here. Like I was, I was, I was looking for something. Uh, I said, oh, I'm, I'm looking for, I don't know, a shirt. And she said, don't panic. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. And again, like she, she saw that in, in a situation in a TV show. So it was a similar situation. And then she was applying that to me. So I'm looking for a shirt. Uh, I wasn't like panicking or whatever, but she, you know, she was kind of using that as a joke and I thought that was very funny. But she used that correctly because she understood it like a native. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Let's see if we got any final questions over here. Uh, Eric says, hi, Drew. How can you help someone to get Frederick and Fluent for Life at a very low cost? Uh, well, they're already like very cheap for what they are, like for, for Fluent for Life, especially uh, if it's, if you're looking for guaranteed fluency, I don't know what else, like what, what would you, what is, what is guaranteed fluency worth to your life? If you think about like, uh, imagine a whole lifetime of being able to speak fluently, what is that worth to you? And most people think, wow, that's like really cheap. Uh, and the same thing with Frederick as well. Uh, hello from Seattle, Washington. Nice to see you there. Hannah BF says, I, I have to leave, but I want to say I love your passion. When you explain something, it is inspiring. Keep up the good work. All right, fantastic. All right, RX says, hi, everyone. I'm from China. Nice to meet you all. Nice to see you there. Brett, nice to see you here. How can we practice speaking specifically, assuming we are not living in an English-speaking country? and also assume we know the basics of the language. Uh, again, as I usually recommend, um, the, the speaking practice is it's like a very small portion of the actual learning. I would spend more time getting more examples until you feel that you really understand something well. And then when you have the opportunity to speak, the vocabulary will come out. So you could, uh, like writing would be a better way to practice your speaking, the output of that. I mean, you can physically speak, but if you're talking about just speaking by yourself, uh, it's not really very necessary unless you just want to hear yourself. But the, the important thing is to understand the vocabulary very well. If you don't understand or if you have doubts about anything, that's what's going to stop you from speaking. So it's not about having a speaking partner. You just need to understand that vocabulary very well. Okay, so I would spend more time getting more examples, eliminating uh, any doubt that you have about particular words or phrases. Uh, but it's easy, certainly, to find lots of native speakers online if you want to speak with someone. But the majority of your improvement will come from just understanding the language better. Even in a conversation, you will learn more just by listening to other people and getting examples from other people. It's, it's not, not really what you say, it's just getting examples from them. And that means we can actually improve a lot with just watching videos or watching other people speak. That's why people can watch these videos right here. Uh, even though you're not speaking anything to me, you're still improving because you're understanding the language better. Uh, Lewis says, how to learn grammar and apply it. Uh, you need to understand, connect grammar with situations. So like understanding something in the past or something happening in the future, but not trying to think about the rules. It's just, oh, look, like if, it's, if I'm doing it right now, if it's happening right now, we put that I-N-G on there. So this is the same way as I was explaining before about how young children understand grammar rules. So they're not really trying to get a grammar table and fill in all the examples in a, in a conscious way. They're getting pieces of these things. And as they get more pieces, they can start making a connection. So let me, let me give you like one kind of simple example about this. Uh, let's say they learn like, they learn the word go. 
uh, and then they learn the word walk. Now, if they also hear going and they understand this, their brain makes that connection naturally. Huh, I bet this would be walk, walking. I bet. And so their brain, again, it's like a target where we have uh, the brain is trying to understand what the rules of the language are, but as a native speaker, not like, a, not like someone just telling you what the rules are. We want to discover that. That's how you learn to speak. So you learn to discover these rules by yourself. So you learn something like walk, and then maybe you are like 90% 90 90 sure that if you have go and going, then we probably have walk and walking as well. And then when you hear that's correct, ding, bullseye, we got that correct. Yes, I understand, I understand that correctly. And now I can apply that with confidence, okay? So the point is not to take a grammar table and try to memorize all of the examples in different ways we would say it. Try to get one thing that you understand correctly. Going, okay, that's interesting. How can I apply that to something else? I bet there are other verbs that also have this same thing applied to them. Now, there might be some exceptions. I will learn those as I go. But in general, this is what we're trying to do. So we fill in these as we get these pieces. Okay? You're not trying to take a whole completed thing and memorize it. You want to get these different pieces of grammar and put them together naturally. Okay? So you might get this piece and then this piece over here and then, oh, look at that. I bet this piece right here is this. And you're not thinking about it uh, like consciously, I mean, you might as a learner think about this, but children aren't, aren't really thinking about it like that. They're not trying to think about a grammar table and plug this in, but when they're asked, uh, how do you know what word to use? They just develop a sense for what's correct, and that's how they do it, okay? So remember, the English as a second language approach is to try to give you all of the answers that you memorize, but that's not how we learn. The brain doesn't want to do that. The brain wants to solve puzzles and the brain likes when, oh, look at that. I get some information and ooh, I figured out the puzzle. I solved the problem. I got go going, walk, walking. So I bet if we have talk over here, oh, I bet that's talking. And they become more confident as they get more examples that really help them feel that they understand something well. As they feel certain, they speak, okay? So I know people want to improve like speaking a lot, but I promise you the more confident you feel because you know the language well, if you really know the language well, the speaking is the easy part, okay? And, and even finding people to talk with online is easy as well, especially if you're a Fluent for Life member, we can give you lots of ways to do that, okay? But the more important thing, like I could go, if I go to, I don't know, like a different country, I go to Korea, uh, I might meet lots of people. I could just walk around on the street and try to talk with people. But if I don't feel confident about my Korean, I'm not going to speak with people very well. Okay? So understand the language better. Get more examples. You can do all this by yourself anywhere you live. You don't need to be talking with anybody. It's very easy to do this. Uh, let's see. Bridges says, Hi, Drew. Uh, do you know how to... Quiet the chattering in the chattering mind in order to absorb the learning. Ah, uh, well, this is a, a bit more of a psychology issue, but the, the thing that really quiets the mind is focus when you are interested in something. So if I give you a puzzle and I say, okay, try to solve this, then the mind becomes quiet automatically because it's really just focusing on that particular issue, okay? <clears throat> but if I, if I give you like a bunch of grammar tables and I say, okay, I want you to memorize these things, then the mind immediately gets like very noisy, like a child in a classroom. But you notice like a, a child in a classroom, when the child is listening to a good story, the child is quiet and focused on that particular thing. So the brain works the same way. If you, if you give the brain what it wants, and what your brain wants is the ability to solve puzzles and little challenges, that's why people like playing games. They like to get some information and then solve that last piece where ah, I figured it out, I understand how something works, and that's how you become native. 
Uh, Zasha says, sorry to bother you again. He requires urgent management of asthma. I'm studying at the OET exam, trying to write a referral letter. <laughs> yes, do not, like, you should go talk to an actual teacher <laughs> or, like, a, a medical doctor about this because this is different from just a, a grammar question, and I don't know what you need specifically for your test or whatever. Alexander says, thank you, Drew, for the thought of eliminating doubt. It's useful indeed. Yes, uh, if you have doubt, you will not speak. It's really that simple. So even if you have people around you to speak with, if you feel shy, it means you have some kind of doubt about your language. So you must eliminate the doubt, and then the speaking will, will follow naturally, automatically. Uh, that's when you start learning subconsciously deep learning, right? Yes, it, I mean, the, the learning happens automatically when you're learning this way. The point is not to tell yourself the answer, it's to discover the answer. All right. I know it seems like a slight difference, but a teacher's job is really to guide you to the correct answer to make it easy to do that. So I don't tell my kids, look, cent means 100. I just say, oh, like, that's interesting. Like, what does cent mean? And if they, if they ask, like, look at that, a centimeter and then a centiliter. So what do you think this means? So I'm asking leading questions that lead to the answer. Like, I know what they're going for, but when they discover it themselves, they feel a lot more excited about that. Uh, let's see. Azra says, I feel tired and down so often these days. Vocabulary is really an issue for me. Uh, it's killing me for real. Well, what, what exactly is the issue with the vocabulary? It sounds like I'm guessing you're probably trying to learn a bunch of vocabulary, but you don't know what it means. Uh, and that's, that, would be, that would be a frustrating thing. Dan says, hello, best teacher in the world. Well, you're too kind. Mr. Mo says, do you think reading stories could improve the communication skill? Yes, anything that eliminates doubt. So reading stories, watching videos, lots of different things like that. Grammar table is very useful. In China, we recite the table and do many exercises. Yes, that is a typical way many people learn, but it's much faster if you do it my way. <laughs> so there, it's like, it's like I, could, I could swim from here to America. It's possible, but uh, I'd much rather take an airplane because it's going to get me there faster and I will stay dry and not get eaten by sharks, that kind of thing. But again, so how can or how I can remember any words or expressions I'm studying and I'm getting lots of examples until I deeply understand them because I realize when I don't use them, I lose them eventually. Yeah, there will be some, like even me, I will, if I don't use some English, I will forget it. I mean, that's just, you know, there, there are some things like that. Uh, but typically, uh, if you feel more confident about vocabulary, you will remember it and you will feel more, uh, feel more confident about that vocabulary as you're getting uh, more varied examples. And so it's really about like understanding something. You, you feel that moment when you understand it well enough to use it. It's, it. You can actually feel that process. So when you understand something, you get that, ah, ha, ah, I got it. When you feel that, that's when you know you understood something, all right? So you like you, you don't need to take I don't want you to think about like uh, like lessons. It's more about just take a word or a phrase and just focus on that. So if you understand it and you feel confident about using it, move on to the next thing. You don't need to sit and repeat uh, phrases over and over again to help you understand them. I'll give you an example. Uh, so someone mentioned like the Chinese example about like uh, memorizing grammar tables and stuff like that. Uh, I don't, I, I, I can only speak about Japan as an example, I can't really talk about China, uh, but memorizing grammar tables, a lot of people do that here too and they still can't speak. So memorizing grammar tables is not the way. But, uh, but Brett's specific question about like how to review something, uh, remember the, the number one thing is to focus. So you pick a word or a phrase, I'm going to give you an example from me learning Japanese, all right? Uh, Let's say I want to learn uh, a word. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I'm going to write the, the, the kanji, so the Japanese character. Uh, I'll just put this up here for you uh, like that. Okay, so this is not very neat, uh, but this is the, uh, the character for snake. Uh, and again, I'm not like my kanji writing is like as bad as my English writing. <laughs> All right, so I can look at this, and there are two ways I can learn this. I can take this and I can try to repeat it over and over and over and over again. And maybe I would remember it. Maybe not, maybe I would, but I could, I could, I could, that's the traditional way of learning it. Uh, but instead, 
I'd rather try to just remember it quickly, maybe review it once or twice to really understand that. Uh, but I want to take something like this and think like, oh, like, what's a fast way to learn this? So what we have here, these are actually three different parts of this character. And I'd rather tell a story uh, to myself just to help me remember it. Um, and I want to make a story. So this part over here, this actually means bug or insect. Uh, this part up here, it's kind of like a house, and this part over here, it's not a very, like, uh, clear-looking character, but this is like, it's kind of like a person, like, like, slumped over. So what I do to remember this is I'm going to think of a story. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a kanji, but uh, many Chinese people can read this as well, and it goes, like, both ways. So more of the, the kanji that I know, I, I know a lot of kanji, I can't actually read it, but I know what it means. All right. So as an example, we've got bug. I'm just going to give you a translation just because it's faster over here. So we've got house over here. Uh, and then we've got kind of this is it could be a spoon uh, or like a body that's kind of slumped over. So I tell myself a story where if I think a bug bite, if I think a bug bite is bad and a snake bite, wow, that's going to leave me in my house slumped over like this. So this is my way, it's, uh, this is just a mnemonic, but it's a way of triggering that uh, understanding in my brain where it becomes unforgettable for me, okay? So I don't take this and try to like, again, it is possible to force information into your brain through repetition, but you don't really feel mastery over that thing. You don't really own it until you get that aha moment like, ah, now I got it. Now this kanji is unforgettable, okay? So this is like me just thinking of a personal way to remember this kanji. Uh, and I can use a mnemonic like this because when you write, you have time to think. But when you're trying to speak, the point is you need to get lots of examples so you feel very confident that you understand something well. Okay? You need to eliminate the doubt. So if I write this, if I try just like writing it over and over again, I'm going to write it, write it, write it. I might write it incorrectly. Maybe I write it, it's like, uh, oh no. Wait a minute, does it have two of these boxes or one or something? I don't remember. But this way, like, I remember how to write it. I can write it quickly. I can explain it. I have confidence about this character. But notice, there are lots of other kanji I don't know. Okay? So I become fluent in individual characters as I learn them. And if I understand them well, then I can use them. I can write them. I can read them. I can understand them. Okay, so I don't, I, I want to make it clear, like you become fluent in individual words and phrases rather than the whole language. So I don't try to learn like a whole bunch of kanji, try to remember them and like, oh, let me write these. I want to focus on something, learn it quickly, but understand it well, and then move on to the next one. And that's how I'm learning them. So this process, it will take me, I don't know, maybe like a few months or something like that, but I will know the kanji that most people, it takes them many years to learn, okay? So it's not because I'm smarter, it's just I'm trying to learn it so I really understand this and then I move on to the next thing. So I know this piece very well, I know this piece very well, I know this piece very well, and I know the story that connects them all, okay? I'm giving you a Japanese example, but this is the same for any language. The point is, eliminate the doubt. Okay, I'm going to say that like over and over and over again. Whatever triggers that, you need to eliminate the doubt, and that's when you speak. Okay, so whatever your word is, focus on it, get more examples. You may have a situation where you forget something, but I don't, I don't, I don't worry about that personally. Uh, like I might forget a word. It might even be like a funny thing in a conversation where like, I, I can't remember, I don't know, some word. But it's, it's never an issue that stops me from communicating because I can always switch to something else. There's always another way to express something in a conversation. All right. Uh, people who have uh, speak like me, the native fluency blueprint, Fluent for Life will know about uh, this, this idea of moving like water, where you don't, you don't get stuck on one word, you just move to something else very easily. Okay? So that, that's why when you're learning vocabulary, this is just is one example of that, uh, but when you're learning English vocabulary, uh, if you learn it like a native, you understand that a situation actually has many different ways of expressing you know, what, whatever that thing is you want. So you could have, uh, like, some, someone gets hurt, they could say, ouch, 
damn, fuck, you know, something like that. Lots of different words they could use to express like the pain of that situation. Okay. So if you're in a conversation and you can't remember a specific word, that's fine. Either make a joke about it or move on to something else. It's usually very easy to do that. You can express something uh, rather than expressing it one way, we express it in a different way. All right. So don't worry about trying to like master every, every word and remember everything perfectly. Your brain doesn't work like that, but it, it will remember most things, especially if you use them frequently. But even if you don't, then you can just use something else. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Caesar's says, have you ever made uh, content about common topics and conversations? Because I think it also related to keep the conversation. Yes. Uh, this is what fluent for life is. If you click on the link in the description about it, you will learn all about that. We have created all these lessons already that take you through this process of helping you understand, giving you fluency triggers that really make the language memorable, and you can learn whatever you like for whatever you need for your life. All right, Duh says, uh, you helped me nail my English proficiency, proficiency exam. You are the real deal. Thank you very much. Glad to hear it. Uh, if you know other people who I can help, send them my way. Uh, let's see. See, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really like spaced repetition isn't really going to help you uh, unless you already know the information really well. So it's better to get varied review. That's why I recommend something uh, like this. So I could, I could get spaced repetition and continue to review it over and over and over, and maybe I would remember it, but it's much easier to remember it this way. So I can learn this. I can take like one or two minutes, create a story for this, and then now I have it forever. I don't need to write it over and over and over. I could write it any time I like now, all right, without the spaced repetition. All right, uh, repetition as well as the best way to learn as well as the best way to learn a foreign language. Yeah, I, I don't really recommend people just repeat stuff because it doesn't help you understand the language better. Remember, you have to eliminate the doubt. There's, there's something blocking you there, whatever that is, where you don't really remember it yet, but when you eliminate that doubt, ah, now you've got it, okay? That's what we're looking for. Spaced repetition isn't giving you new information to help you understand something better. It's just trying to delay, okay, I remember this and maybe I remember it later, but probably you will forget it. Uh, let's see, I've never heard you talking about uh, chat GPT. I mention it occasionally, but uh, when I'm using it, like I find it, it makes errors. So I'm, I'm less, less like reliant on it. As a teacher, I can use it because I know how to correct things about ChatGPT, but as a learner, I would be less, uh, less certain about that. Uh, let's see, I know your teaching method is interesting. Glad to hear it. Uh, this approach works well when learning other languages. Yes, it works for every language. Every part is a story, very good, yes. Uh, like when you don't know a specific word, you can call it the whatchamacallit. Yes, people do that, natives do that all the time. What's the word, what's the word I'm thinking of? Ah, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's on the tip of my tongue, ah, I can't, I can't remember it. It's, natives forget words all the time. And that's why, uh, but it doesn't seem like that because they just switch to something else. They're moving like water. They don't get stuck on a rock. They just move around it. They pick something else. All right, let's see. Brett's got it. Let's see. XD back again. A minority in Canada. I can tell we have no writing words, but we're fluent in talking and speaking our own languages, like for sure. Now, I wonder if I can do this like what I did when I was five or six. I don't know what exactly you're referring to. I know you should be studying your college courses, though, not playing around with your new iPhone 15. All right, you be good over there. All right, uh, I think that is it for today. But remember, the basic idea, if you're doing this in your own home, you want to eliminate doubt. All right, if you feel, and, and do this word by word. If there's something you want to say, but you're nervous about saying it, think about why. Why am I nervous about that? Is it the pronunciation? Am I worried about a usage or something? It just means you don't really understand something well. You need to understand it well enough that you feel that moment, ah, that moment of understanding the aha moment, okay? And that's word by word, all right? So as you, as you understand something, when I, when I thought of the story for this, because I'm thinking like, how am I going to make up a story with these like random characters? Like what does a story, like you could, you could think of many other ways to tell this, like a story about these characters. Like there's a, 
like a snake eats uh, eats a, a bug or it, like you know, and then the snake goes into the house or but that's it's it's for me that doesn't help me. All right, I can I'll probably like make no, another video about how to remember stuff better, um, like using these kind of mnemonics. But uh, in general, you want to eliminate the doubt. That's it. It's really that simple. Okay. Hopefully this makes sense. If you'd like to learn more, you can get Fluent for Life or Frederick. Click on the link in the description below this video for both of those. And I will see you, uh, look at that, kind of trying to find a part-time job. Okay, that's a good idea then. Forget, forget your classes and, and get, get some work instead. <laughs> all right, have a fantastic day out there, and I'll see you all next video. Bye-bye.